Good morning and uh, welcome to this joint session uh, between Multiprof Property Intelligence and uh, Snijman and the Jager. Um, I'm Aubrey Snijman, but I'm not the Snijman from uh, Snijman and the Jager. And uh, next to me is uh, Johan Müller, not from Multiprof, but from Snijman and the Jager, so please don't get confused. Um, the topic today is a discussion on a court case uh, dealing with uh, conversion of uh, garages in a sectional title complex. Um, but we want to look at the broader picture of uh, additions and alterations in complexes. Uh, thank you, Dion, for, for joining us. It's always good to have the legal experts with us. Um, Multiprof Property Intelligence is a town planning and architectural company uh, with a big interest in sectional titles. We also do uh, property valuations, uh, property inspections, and we uh, try to connect the dots between all the different professionals in the industry, and especially where uh, it comes to sectional title, there's really a lot to know and a lot of different um, aspects to look at uh, and therefore it's very nice for us to share this uh, with uh, Snijman and the Jager. Um, Johan, do you just want to share a bit about your company? Thank you very much, Aubrey. Uh, yes, it's always a privilege uh, being on, uh, on the same venue or the stage as, as Multiprof. Um, for those who haven't uh, dealt with us in the past, uh, we are predominantly Pretoria and Midrand firm, uh, specializing in property related matters. Uh, that obviously includes um, a large portion of sectional titles and the management thereof and uh, registration, opening of sectional title registers. So the different legislation relating to sectional titles is for us of utmost importance. Um, in the past, we've, we've basically seen that uh, sectional titles have become a bit of a stepchild, uh, if we can put it that way, and a lot of people disregard the legislation that applies to these sectional title schemes. Um, with detrimental uh, circumstances, obviously, and, and um, causes as a result thereof. So what I think we are aiming, based on the latest uh, court case, is just to bring us back to reality to see exactly what requirements we have for purposes of amendment changes of certain specific uh, portions of sectional titles and uses for other purposes than the, that uh, was intended. Um, so that's the main idea. Thank you. Um, let's start at the very beginning and just look at the differences between a full title property and a sectional title property. Now, as we all know, when you buy a full title property, you are the owner of the structures, the land, and there you can do basically as you like within the uh, regulations of the town planning scheme and the national building regulations but you are the sole owner and, and you don't have to ask permission from uh, anybody else. On the other side, uh, sectional title is a method of ownership whereby you buy the inside of a unit, uh, four and a half inches wall to the inside and everything to the inside, and the rest you get a, a, a undividable share of common property. And there's a huge difference, and uh, this court case has a lot to do with the understanding of that concept. And then, of course, we have what we call exclusive use areas that form part of this court case. So just to summarize, in the sectional title, you uh, own your section, so the inside, basically, Everything else is common property, including the outside of, uh, of, of your unit, the roof outside, and um, then you have common property. The exception is uh, still common property, but whereby you uh, obtain exclusive use of a specific area uh, in, in, in the complex. 
Now, the different type of plans that we need to understand uh, that is uh, applicable in a complex, and, uh, and that's the uh, the sectional title complexes, obviously, uh, would be, firstly, we will look at the zoning. And the zoning uh, is important in the sense that it will determine the amount of units you can build, and then, uh, important in this case as well, things like parking requirements and issues like coverage. Coverage being the total uh, amount of roofed area in the complex, uh, but pertinent, and pertinent to this case is uh, the requirement for parking. According to the uh, zoning, you will need to have a site development plan, and the site development plan is the plan for the whole complex, indicating the positioning of units, uh, the positioning of entrances, exits, uh, as well as where the parking is provided on the property, where landscaping is done, and that is approved before any building plan can be approved uh, when you start with a, a new complex. Then, of course, you have national building regulations that determine that all temporary and permanent structures need approved building plans. Uh, it would vary slightly from council to council. Uh, in certain uh, councils, small building works is excluded. Uh, for instance, a very small window house uh, you only need permission, but you don't need this, a plan. In Swanee, for instance, you need for all of those structures, you need building plans. So it's important if you, uh, wherever you operate, that you uh, find out if there's anything that excluded from, uh, from building plans, but mostly all structures need building plans. Um, and then there is, of course, in terms of ownership, we have sectional title plans. Now, whenever you deal with a, a, a property, uh, you only become the owner of what is bought, uh, what, what is indicated on the sectional title plan. Uh, I just want to check, we have uh, some questions. Uh, Jenny, can you just... Uh, uh, get the questions for us where you can participate. Uh, we just would like to see what your understanding is of, of the subject that, we, that, that we're discussing. Um, so the first question will be about uh, permission for additions and extensions. If you can just uh, uh, assist us there. Uh, I did not say that uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can just post it in the chat box and at the end we will see if we haven't answered the questions, we will specifically look at, uh, at the questions uh, that, that you post. Um, let's just look at the, at the results, who can give permission. Uh, it seems like the biggest percentage understand exactly that uh, when permission is, is required, it is from all of the above. Yeah. Um, it, it's very important, especially uh, for trustees that might be listening and the managing agents, that whenever a request is received for permission for any alterations or additions, just saying that trustees have no objection cause a lot of misunderstandings. So we recommend that any approval should always read something like the trustees have in principle no objection on condition that all the relevant conditions in the town planning scheme, in the national building regulations, and in all sectional title uh, uh, registration is uh, adhered to. Then you cover yourself uh, in the sense that we often get it that uh, people that have made additions 
just say, but we got permission from the trustees, so what is the problem? Um, that, that, that will solve a lot of the misunderstandings that, that owners have when it comes to, uh, to approval for additions and extensions. Uh, John, anything from your side? Well, well, I think um, Aubrey basically summed it up quite well, but I think what's very important, and you know, it's not easy to answer the question right out to say that all of those specific institutions above have to give um, their consent immediately depends on what you're requesting. I mean, that's that's of the utmost importance. Maybe it's prudent that we have a look at at the relevant court case that um, that basically gave rose to this discussion today. And um, it's it's basically a court case um, titled uh, Manier versus Bay Dunes Body Corporate. Now, basically, what happened in this instance. As Aubrey previously um, explained, is there was a sexual title scheme in terms of which there were in excess of 170 units. This specific scheme was situated in the Mossel Bay municipality. And subsequently, when the scheme was developed and afterwards, with or without the necessary consent of the body corporate, some of these owners started to convert some of the exclusive use areas being the garages that were awarded to them, uh, they started converting them in living quarters. So you could imagine that it obviously increased the volume of occupants because living quarters were more abundant in this regard. But as Aubrey previously said and, and basically emphasized the parking requirement, what happened was that the Mossel Bay municipality came to the uh, the trustees and said, we've got a major problem with the conversion of these exclusive use areas because you don't have building plans for these purposes. And secondly, our municipal bylaws require that there should be two parking areas per unit. And each and every time you convert a relevant unit or garage in a living quarter, you are taking away one of these parking areas, transgressing the bylaws, in other words, and the town planning scheme in that regard. So they obviously tried to legalize it by means of a resolution, and they concentrated on a requirement of a so-called special resolution that is prescribed in terms of the Sectional Title Schemes Management Act, more specifically Section 29. But they said, and I need to, to actually quote this for you, Section 29 says that the body corporate may make alterations or improvements to common property that are necessary or reasonably necessary. The proposal must be implemented um, by a special resolution adopted at a general meeting. So they basically relied on this and said, all right, we're going to legalize all these conversions and we're going to do it by means of that specific resolution. But Mrs. Muneer, who at this specific stage stayed in Kimberley, but she wanted to retire in Bayview, she said it's not that easy. This is not an alteration on a specific sectional title scheme as prescribed in Section 29. She basically referred to Section 13 of the sectional title schemes, which says that when the purpose for which a section or exclusive use area is intended. Um, it should be used for that purpose as indicated on the sectional title plan. So for those who don't know, and I think Aubrey would concur, that if you've got a exclusive use area on a sectional title plan, it clearly indicates for what use you have to use that, that exclusive use. And if you want to use it for something else, it clearly states that you may use it for something else, but with the consent of all the owners. So not a special resolution, which is normally a two-thirds majority. It's basically a concept of all the owners have to consent. And needless to say, Mrs. Manier, at the end of the day, she was not happy with it, so all of the owners will not consent to that relevant area. So to cut to a chase, ladies and gentlemen, what happened in this specific instance was that they could not legalize the conversion in to the living quarters because they could not obtain all the consents required from the owners. Mrs. Manier objected against it and she stuck to her guns in that specific regard. Now, I think the benchmark in this regard and the lesson to be learned is, is that if you have exclusive use areas in your complexes, now, 
before we say exclusive use areas, what is the character of exclusive use area? Um, like Aubrey said, in, in character it remains common property, it belongs to the body corporate in ownership. However, it is exclusively reserved for the use of that relevant owner for whom it is reserved. So I think that's the, the important part. You've got to wrap your head around it, that it's not in ownership mine. I just have the exclusive use of it. Uh, you want, perhaps I can just interrupt you for a while. Um, the, in a typical complex, the issue is much bigger than only that. According to the National Building Regulations, uh, any structure can also only be used for what it is indicated on, on the building plan. Now, in the typical case, it would be indicated as a, a garage or a parking area for vehicles. So, whenever you want to use it for anything else, even though you might not make any physical changes to the volume, you still need to submit a building plan for that. Uh, there's different requirements for living areas as well, and we have found sometimes that things like the ceiling height, for instance, for a garage is less than for a living space. So even if you do the conversion, it might never be possible to submit a building plan and get it approved. But even more important is that when you submit a building plan, you first need to submit a site development plan and council will immediately see that you are taking away parking from the complex because it used to be part of the minimum parking requirements. So council technically should not approve those changes before there is a solution to provide parking somewhere else. Now, in real life, it would seem like, well, there's enough parking, but you also need to keep the visitors' parking available. So the fact that there is a parking space next to your unit or in front of, of the garage, that is not allowed to be used for uh, parking from the um, from the council side, but also important to understand because it's common property, that area is for the use of everybody and for their enjoyment. And I think part of this, uh, the court case also dealt with the fact that if you're, you park your car on common property, you are withholding the right of use for pleasure or entertainment, walking, whatever it is, from your co-owners in the complex. Um, so if you try to, to convert a garage, one of the things that you will have to deal with is how to replace the parking that you have that is required on common property and perhaps you want you can just explain the procedure how that can be done because technically you might have to buy a piece of common property and get some special permission so that you can register it for your use correct um Aubrey, well i think that's a major problem in many of the the complexes although your body corporate has the right and jurisdiction to decide from time to time to alienate certain body, um, common properties or to acquire certain mm -hmm. properties, I think the balancing act is of the utmost importance. You have to bring it within the town planning scheme and you always have to keep in mind how and under what circumstances those specific zoning rights were approved um, and what the bylaws require for that purpose. As soon as you start deviating from that, you might have all your specific consents and your ducks in a row, to put it uh, uh, metaphorically. But um, at the end of the day, this might cause a concept where you deviate from that specific um, from that specific bylaw requirement. So, in the event where the specific common property is just not sufficient to satisfy the parking needs, I think it would be necessary and prudent 
of the body corporate to bring it in line again. And that would obviously entail that they either have to acquire further common property and incorporate it within the existing common property, get a rezoning for purposes of that to, to uh, suitable parking. Um, and they have to manage the balancing act of conversions. They can't just left, right and center, even if it's with all the specific occupants consent, they can't just grant these conversions and obviously change the character of the exclusive use areas. Um, I think that's of the utmost importance. And I think to add to this specific concept, we've got major problems in practice, especially where people do additions to um, sectional title schemes. Um, thoroughly under the impression of some sorts that that land on which the unit is situated belongs to them. Uh, it does not belong to them. It might be reserved as an exclusive right, but in essence, it belongs to the body corporate. And if you extend on that, you need the consent of the body corporate and you physically need to incorporate that in your unit itself, which is quite a lengthy application process in terms of section 26 of the sectional titles. Yes, uh, thanks for that, Johan. Um, it, it's just an indication about the complexities that a complex will run into when you start to give uh, approval or you don't act against owners that do uh, convert or make additions in any form to, uh, to, to a unit in, 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 in sectional title. The procedure would be uh, if you want to make any changes, would be to start with uh, getting the information, if it is possible, given the existing situation in the complex. Um, our experience doing complex audits, whereby we compare all the existing buildings and structures with the existing approved building plans and sectional title plans is that the older a complex is the more problematic it is because over a period of 40 years 40 different sets of trustees have given permission to people to uh, to make changes and very few of those have been done in a proper and legal way and therefore, it's very difficult to know where to start. Um, so as a company, we suggest that if you uh, are in a complex where major changes have been made and there's a lot of requests for, for new additions, that first you need to establish what is existing at this stage. Uh, we discussed the concept of coverage. If more carports have been added than is allowed, you need to know that. There's no use giving permission to an owner to put up a new carport if the coverage that is allowed by the town planning scheme have already been exceeded. And therefore, it's recommended that one start the process to establish how much more area would be available as far as coverage is concerned because you need to share that equally with all the owners. You can't give one owner permission to put up four cardboards and then tell the next guy, oh, sorry, there's no coverage left, so, so you can't do it. Um, of course, you always need to comply with all the other requirements. As we said, parking is one, uh, coverage is one, um, and then you need to submit building plans and you need to make the changes to the site development plan and then if it's any of the uh, types of changes where you may add an additional room or you add additional uh, scullery, of course then you need to have the sectional title plans uh, adapted because one of the functions of trustees in the body corporate is to ensure that the levies that are paid is in accordance with the participation quota. And of course, that is derived from the size of your unit. So if you allow people to make additions and you don't insist that the PQs are rectified, 
technically all the other owners of uh, paying a part of the, that owner's levy and that is against uh, the basic concept of a sectional title scheme. I think, um, just to add to what Aubrey says, I think for those estate agents who constantly do listings of uh, sectional title properties, uh, the dead giveaway obviously would be is if you do a property search, whether you use Windeed or WinSearch or whatever the case may be, and you compare the extent of the sectional title unit with whatever the seller tells you it is. You know, you will probably hear from the seller that I've got a 200 square meter sectional title unit, whilst on the deed search it only reflects 125 hypothetically. And although there are certain closed shaves, I think it's normally abundantly clear that there has been added to this specific property. Or if you would go to the premises and you would see the garage doors have suddenly been replaced with sliding doors, I think that's a dead giveaway as well. But um, to add to what Aubrey says is, is that if you have added to the footprint of your relevant unit, you have extended it in size and that size will not automatically be adjusted. Um, it will remain the same. It will remain that 125 square meters until you physically re-register a re-approved and redrafted sectional title plan, which shows that increased extent or size. And that is a formal application we have to go through. So when you've got your consent from the body corporate, you need your building plan approved, you need your building activities to take place, you need your sectional title plan to be approved and re-registered in the deeds office by means of the prescribed um, uh, procedure. That's of the utmost. Yeah. Well, and if you're in, in Swane, you obviously also still have to do an application in terms of clause 289 of the bylaws, whereby the council compare the uh, situation on the property with the approved building plans and the sectional title plans. If they don't correlate, they won't issue you with the 289 uh, certificate, basically. Uh, people refer to it as a Spluma certificate. That's not 100% correct. In Mabumalanga, of course, you need the Spluma certificate. Um, and therefore, uh, especially for, for the property practitioners, we see it on a regular basis where a deal that you have a willing buyer, willing seller, cannot take place because these documents are not up to date. The banks on a, a more often now would ask for approved building plans and sectional title plans. And if it's not done when you list the property, this can take you up to nine months to get this sorted. So uh, our advice is that whenever you deal in a sectional title complex, you make sure that you get these documents up front. Uh, you put it in your declaration whereby an owner is made aware of the fact that uh, he need building plans, he need sectional title plans, um, and you can immediately start with the process and not wait until you have a willing buyer, willing seller, uh, and then uh, try to fix this. Uh, you will lose some of your commission in the process. Um, and now being a property practitioner, obviously include this as responsibilities to make sure that your buyer is protected. And uh, that brings us to the question on the screen that uh, I'm very uh, excited to see that most people got it right. Uh, section of, uh, in any uh, property, the owner at the moment is responsible for all problems in the unit or on the property. So whenever you take ownership of a property, you become the owner of each and every problem that ever existed on the property. So you can't use the excuse that I bought it like that. Council's only going to deal with the owner as it is at the time of the problem and um, therefore it's also of utmost importance that this documentation 
move from seller to buyer. If building plans, for instance, can't be located and council having, have no uh, obligation to keep those plans, the National Building Regulations state very clearly that the owner is the person that should have a copy of the plan. So if plans can't be, be uh, obtained from council and the owner don't have it, it is the owner's responsibility to have plans redrawn from scratch and uh, have uh, everything done to get them approved and get the certificate of occupancy. And if necessary, there must be the extension to the sectional title plans. And that is the responsibility of the owner when the property is sold. And the uh, property practitioner is becoming the pivotal person to make sure that that is done. Otherwise, your buyer can have a, a, a loss after he, he bought it. Uh, we can tell you stories, nightmares of people that bought properties and the moment they uh, became the owner, they lost half of the value of the property uh, because there was no plans, the units had to be demolished because it was on dolomite built without the requirements. And, and that becomes the owner's problem. And uh, as a property practitioner, there is some, uh, 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 you, you have some responsibility as well to make sure that your buyer is not negatively affected by it. So uh, yes, you cannot use the excuse that you bought it like that and uh, Often, sadly, we hear that the estate agent said everything was fine, no problem. You are buying this, you're buying the garden, you're buying the garage, you, you're buying uh, the law bar. And in real, in, when we look at the facts, you only bought the inside of your of, of your unit. Yeah. Um, just to add to what Aubrey said, I agree 100% um, out of a legal perspective. I mean, obviously, uh, the illusion is created that the city council is the custodian of all building plans, which is not the case. I mean, the, the, the city council um, basically stores certain uh, building plans, but I mean, it ultimately remains the responsibility of the seller to produce a duly approved building plan. Um, and whether a newly acquired purchaser is able, by means of legal recourse, to uh, recoup his damages when he has to redraft those plans when it comes to light, uh, you know, that's another kettle of fish. But the fact remains is predominantly the registered owner from time to time will be responsible for those specific requirements. Um, and that is that is a very important aspect. We we uh, see numerous instances where the estate agent sold the specific property on face value on whatever the seller told him is the case. But um, it it would probably be much uh, a, a better solution for purposes of the problem to try and establish all the surrounding circumstances with regards to that property when you list it and not when you do the offer to purchase, because between listing and physical sale of the property and the offer to purchase is signing, there is some time to be spared. So in that regard, one can advise the seller and say, sir, we've done a due diligence on your property. We have seen in terms of the sectional type of plan and the extent in the deeds office that it does not coincide with what you basically say. Um, and there has been additions, whether you were the author of that misfortune or not, that's, that's unfortunately, not a time for, for that problem to be sorted out. I think what's important is, is that you establish the problem in advance before we start wasting time during the OTP and transfer process. Yes. Um, Johan, just a, a technicality around that that I'm sure you also uh, have been exposed to perhaps. Uh, we find often that uh, the, uh, in the OTP, the uh, seller will, or the, the buyer will put a condition basically that states that the seller take responsibility of supplying uh, the buyer with a set of approved building plans. And that's where you stop, unfortunately. Now, the problem around that that we often uh, face is that, uh, and often it happened after the transfer 
taken place already. Uh, we are approached to fix the building plans. Um, and as soon as we get involved, we realize that it is impossible to legalize all the structures. Now, the buyer has bought certain things. It was shown to him and he bought it because of that. And I'm, I'm uh, specifically uh, uh, looking at things like LARPAs, uh, where a buyer would buy a place because of the size of the LARPA. Now, often the LARPA is built uh, over a servitude or something like that. And we must, at some stage, tell the buyer, you need to demolish that structure. Now, in the OTP, there's no way of dealing with that. Uh, so the buyer bought a specific uh, property with, with certain buildings on it. Uh, he has committed himself to making sure that approved building plans is provided, but it's impossible to do that. Mm. Uh, the transfer took place. What, what would you recommend? We, we recommend that that you at least make sure that those structures can be legalized before you put something like that in, 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 in your OTP. Um, Aubrey, yes, obviously that is advisable. I mean, to find out, you know, it's, it's senseless of including a contractual term in an OTP if it is not enforceable. Mm. Because if a contract is juridically or jur juristically not enforceable, it, it becomes null and void. Um, but, you know, if we have a situation where there is a contract term included in or post-registration, um, I think one thing that comes to the aid of a buyer in that regard is still our common law um, contractual uh, remedies for purposes of damages. I mean, if I bought a property and um, it was subject to the approval post-registration of a building plan, which now seems to be impossible, forcing me to break down the law part, uh, then in that regard, I do have, as we have old Roman Dutch actions, um, action quantum minoris, in other words, where there's a price reduction, where I physically have to institute action to you and say, listen, mm -hmm. I bought this, I only got half of it, and therefore I need a price reduction, and then I approach court for purposes of assistance to provide that. I mean, it has been done in the past. But again, it poses a very cumbersome exercise because you've got to go through the legal spat of issuing summons against your previous seller and obviously trying to get the required remedy from the courts, which is cumbersome and time consuming. So obviously, whatever you can sort out prior to landing you set yourself in such a position is obviously advisable. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, what, what I hear and, and, and what I would like to emphasize is that there is ways of dealing with this before it becomes a problem. And, uh, and therefore, I think there's uh, the difference between being a salesperson that just introduced a buyer and a seller, uh, you can stand out as a property practitioner by dealing with these things up front, at least making a buyer aware of the possibility of problems and preventing something that could have been sorted out before becoming a court case that costs lots of money and where uh, it's just not in the interest of anybody to go through that process uh, if it is possible to deal with it up front. I, I agree. Um, Aubrey, I think there is a lot of preliminary work that any estate agent, and sorry we'll be hammering on the estate agents, but um, for those who don't know, you are the person who the seller and the purchaser deals with first. I mean, the mortgage originator, the town planner, the attorney are people who are added on in the process after the OTP has been signed. So you are the porthole where this specific matter originates. Um, and there are many source documents that you can obtain with the assistance of a transferring attorney or with assistance of Aubrey and his team, um, such as a copy of the sectional title plans, a copy of the building plans, 
um, you know, a proper deed search just to establish and to compare all the necessary info. I always say that if you sell a product, you've got to know your stock. If you go into a supermarket and you want specific specs on stock and that person can't provide it, you will leave. Uh, you won't listen to him because he's not adding value to your specific acquisition process. So what's important is, is that you've got to know what stock am I marketing, what are the ins and outs, what are the specs, what are the shortcomings, so that they can be established and obviously can be brought under the purchaser's attention. If there are certain aspects which the purchaser is willing to accept on face value or he accepts the risk, then you've got to qualify it as such to indemnify your seller and protect yourself in the process as well. But like Aubrey says, prevention is definitely better than cure. So the more we can address before the offer to purchase is signed and we have to stick band-aids on the, uh, the wound afterwards, the better. Fantastic. Um, do we have any questions, Jenny? We do have a few. Uh, Aldo is asking, what is the definition of a living area? What if a garage is used for storage or for ironing, not living and sleeping, etc.? Okay, uh, yes, we, we have received the question yesterday as well from one of the participants. Um, as we said, according to the National Building Regulations, uh, uh, any room can only be used for what it was a approved for in the case of a garage it is for the parking of a vehicle as we said that is part of the minimum parking requirements so any use of a garage for instance for any other use is not permitted and should be dealt with by the body corporate a big problem is people that use it for storage it still means that the vehicle is parked on common property, so it is not allowed and it is not advisable to just uh, uh, give people permission or just be quiet about owners using their garages for any other use than for parking the car. So, yeah, the, the building plan will indicate it as a, a garage, it will form part of the minimum parking requirements as indicated on the site development plan that is required by the zoning and therefore it should only be used for parking. Okay. I saw an advertisement where two garage units are being offered for sale in a complex. It means that anyone from outside the complex can also buy. What rights will the buyer have? Will he or she also be allowed boats, etc.? I think, um, I think I can answer the specific question. It's, it's very important if you have a look at, I'm talking under correction, but I think it's section 34 of the sectional titles act. It makes provision for the fact that as soon as your ownership in a unit ceases to exist, in other words, if I transfer that unit, I can never ever own the specific exclusive use area separately from that. So I cannot only own a garage in a sectional title complex, unless I'm also a registered owner. What happens if that specific garage um, is not seeded together with the unit that it's coupled with, then in that regard, if it's a loan standing exclusive use area, which is the only asset left, it falls back to the body corporate. In other words, in ownership or in reservation of that exclusive use area, it falls back to the relevant body corporate and it can be redistributed or reassigned to a registered owner uh, in the complex. So you can, at no given stage, if you're not a registered owner in the complex, buy two garages solely, which are exclusive use areas. I think if that is the case, if you already have a unit, you can acquire additional uh, exclusive use areas, that is possible. But I would advise that it obviously takes place with close cooperation with the body corporate because depending on which piece of legislation suffices, you get the 71 sectional title legislation where we did not have exclusive use areas by means of a notorial session. You had it by means of an allocation in terms of a resolution. So there are different ways in which these specific reserved rights have been awarded to clients. And one would have to take each and every circumstances ad hoc. But to go to the question itself, 
uh, you know, separate acquisitions of exclusive use areas without a coupled unit is, is, is simply not permissible in terms of the Act. Yeah. Yeah. So now the, the car doesn't fit into the garage. May I only have an agreement with the body corporate or trustees to park in front of the garage if it doesn't interfere with any driving, walking or any unit, other unit's entrances, i.e. the unit is in the corner with only access to that unit. Parking is not identified as guest parking purely in front of the garage, so it doesn't interfere. Okay. Uh, I think we, we need to get back to the concept of sectional title. Um, I always like to, to use the example to compare it with the franchise, where uh, if you buy a Kentucky Fried Chicken, it comes with certain rules. And uh, you cannot a week later decide, I own a, a Kentucky Fried Chicken, but I don't like red. So we are going to paint everything blue. In a complex, it comes with rules. It comes with common property, it comes with the exclusive use area, and it comes with, with your section. Now, the fact that you bought a car that don't fit into your garage is not the problem of the complex. So the short answer is that you cannot solve your problem by interfering in other people's uh, common property, their enjoyment of, of the area. So if you want to drive that type of car, you should not live in that complex. That is the technicalities around it. I know in, in, in real life it's a bit more complex, but it's difficult when you start solving problems of, uh, of owners that you didn't create. Uh, eventually, it, the worst case scenario is that nobody's car fit in the garage. Mm -hmm. And now you have 60 or 70 or, uh, or 100 cars uh, standing outside and eventually everybody is affected by it. Um, there was also the question about if you have more than one car but only one parking that is, is allocated to you. It's the same principle. If you want to have two cars, you should live in a complex where you are allocated two cars. You can't make the problem that you create the problem of the body corporate um, and therefore uh, my opinion is that they, there's certain people that should never live in a complex. I agree, um, and, and sometimes by solving or seemingly solving the problem, for example, parking your car in a common area otherwise creates a brand new problem, um, such as the specific case that we mentioned where they started utilizing the garage areas for living spaces. So they solved the living problem that they had apparently between 73 units, but they've created another. So in that regard, one has to take cognizance, like you said, of the rules. Um, I, would, I would advise prior to investing in a sectional title complex, request a copy of the governing and the, the conduct and, and, and uh, management rules. Make sure that you adhere to them and that they are obviously fulfillable. And, and, and if not, like Aubrey says, the complex is simply not for you because you're not going to change it by means of, um, of your your actions, I think it's, it's going to cause chaos in the process. Yeah, yeah it, it's even more uh, prevalent when you look at regulations and rules uh, as far as pets are concerned. And uh, again, the, the only person that can really make a difference here is the property practitioner. If you're not used to the concept of sectional title, you will not know to ask for the rules of the complex and you will just pitch up with your two Rottweilers and, uh, and then to understand that, listen, there's a, a rule that states you only allow one dog that is not higher than 40 centimeters uh, measured to the tip of the ear of the dog. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that creates so much problems for the trustees eventually because now it becomes a trustee problem to go to that person and say, you are not adhering to the rules. Uh, that was never brought to the attention of the buyer. And unfortunately, again, it's, it's just a vicious circle that's caused by not 
uh, informing a potential buyer of the rules and regulations of, of, of the complex. Okay, next one. What if a buyer says in the OTP that he accepts that to buy the property with the plans not being in order, signing that he or she is aware that the plans are not in order and will not keep the seller liable? For example, if the seller do not have money to have the plans fixed and is giving the buyer financial discount due to the situation with the plans. Can the common law still be enforced to keep the previous seller liable? Well, I mean, if there's a contractual waiver in that regard, out of a legal perspective, I'm not talking out of a plan, uh, planning perspective or a, a city council uh, perspective, but out of a contractual perspective, you then waive your right to claim any damages from the relevant seller. So you can contractually rule it out. Again, that opens a statutory can of worms because at the end of the day, if you, you cannot contractually agree to sidestep or to disregard a statutory requirement. So if it is a statutory requirement, it's obviously going to be, um, you know, at a certain stage, it's going to be viewed as being contra bonus moris or against public policy, if you include such a specific clause. But being that said, you do get many instances where potential buyers or buyers intend to do building activities themselves. They want to do renovations, they want literally to knock a couple of walls down, which will require them to update the building plans in any event. So they might coincide with that requirement and say, all right, we know we have to do the building plans in future, in the nearby future, and therefore we are willing to waive that. The problem that we have, and I think Aubrey will concur, is the requirements of the banks these days. And that is obviously where the banks finance the property transaction, is that it's not a concept of the seller or the purchaser agreeing to waive the condition. And even if they don't do, the banks don't. You know, so the bank approves the loan subject to building plans approved and updated building plans being provided. And the banks are becoming more and more stringent because you can imagine they don't want to bond something under a security that is not statutory according to requirements. So they say, bring us the updated building plans as a prerequisite before registration. And in that instance, with all due respect, you can include that condition in a contract you will not get away with it. You will obviously, if you want the mortgage bond, which is the wallet or the purse of the transaction to be registered, you would have to comply with those conditions prior to date of registration. But you will probably be able to get away with a condition like that in the event of a cash deal. So that, that uh, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Uh, on that point, perhaps just uh, another misunderstanding uh, or a belief that's out there is that you do not uh, need to change building plans if you only make internal changes to the property. That is not correct. And what we have seen in the past is that uh, uh, people have removed walls inside a unit. And of course, that wall was load bearing and that affects the roof eventually. And whose problem is that? It is the body corporate's problem because the roof technically belongs to the body corporate. So the idea that you don't need to make changes to your building plan if you only make internal changes is not always correct, uh, especially where you remove walls or you make changes to plumbing. Uh, you also need to have those building plans uh, changed and updated. What if you have a double carport in front of your garage? Okay, uh, the first thing we need to establish, I'm always wary when I get that question, is it your carport? How do you know it's your, your carport? Is it because the estate agent said it was yours or is it registered as exclusive use area that it is very seldom in real life? So what you think of as your carport is most likely common property and it's only because your co-owners are very decent that they don't park there. But if they would park there, there is nothing that you can do to prevent them from doing it. So first point is establish by law how 
do you claim it for your own purpose? And I'm in 95% of the cases that we deal with, it is not yours. I, I agree and, and I can't uh, concur more with, with Aubrey. Um, you know, if you have a look at those four pillars or posts that have been planted there, um, the chances that somebody as a developer would have reserved that area, unless it's totally enclosed as part of your unit or even an exclusive use area, um, is, is highly unlikely. So one would have to establish again what, this, what the, state, uh, the, the status of the property is. Is it an exclusive use area? Um, was the necessary consent provided by the body corporate to erect a structure like that on the common property? If not, you would have to make your offer to purchase at least subject to such approval being granted. Um, and then, you know, you have to cross the hurdle of building plans if it's a permanent structure and obviously also your sectional title plans if you want to incorporate it into your unit at the end of the day. Many of your gardens, for example, which seemingly are enclosed with a boundary wall are not your gardens. Um, you know, you get certain developers who you know, if they were the developers in this specific instance, I can, I can bet you that they are not exclusive use areas because they never reserve exclusive use areas. So that is very important, easily ascertainable to find out whether it's exclusive use, whether it belongs to you in some sort of an allocation or an exclusive use. But um, again, I think it all comes back, Aubrey, to doing your homework and, and, and obviously doing everything prior to signing of the OTL. Yeah. And on that same uh, uh, subject, uh, and perhaps a word of warning to trustees and body corporate, and it specifically refers to Wendy Houses. Uh, a lot of uh, Wendy Houses are being added in complexes and uh, the owner would claim it as his because he bought it and he put it in the backyard uh, and everything goes well until there is a problem, for instance, a fire would start in the Wendy uh, because Wendy's are not fire resistant uh, and it's very easy for a fire to start there. If the fire starts in the Wendy and the unit burned down or two units burned down, uh, technically uh, one would think that, well, the owner is the responsible person. But that is the point where the owner turns around and say, but this Wendy was common property. Then he was never the owner. And make sure in your insurance uh, uh, contract, because normally, typically, it would state that they insure a building of brick and tiles. Now, the risk of uh, a fire starting in a brick and tile uh, building is, let's say, one in a hundred thousand. So you pay a premium for that risk. Now you allow a windy house with a much higher uh, possibility of creating a fire. So it is possible, depending on the wording, that if the fire starts in the Wendy, you burn down five units, there's a claim of five million rand, your insurance will say, we will pay 500,000 rand because you, you are not insured for the risk that you created. And then it becomes the problem of each and every owner in the complex. It's not that easy to just say, it's your Wendy, we're not going to bother about it, we're going to close our eyes. Um, and therefore, again, we would like to recommend that uh, all complexes that have these type of things, that uh, uh, audit is undertaken to really determine what belong to who, what is your risk, and that, uh, that you work out a system of rectifying these things before it's too late and, and you create a problem for all the owners in, in, in the complex. Any more questions? Uh, we're running out of time, but let's do a last one. What if the garage is a section and not an exclusive use area? Well, you know, I think, I think that changes it a little bit because in this specific instance where we had the case, um, the garages were exclusive use areas. They didn't form part of the relevant unit. Um, 
if it is included in your specific unit, like a lot of double garages are, then in that regard, it will form part of your sectional title plan. Um, you are still, in my humble opinion, not entitled, and maybe Aubrey yeah. can slot in, you're not entitled to use the garage, which is stipulated as such on the building plan and stipulated as such on the sectional title plan for another purpose than it is designated on those plans. So the fact that it forms part of your unit does not deviate from that requirement. Um, the only advantage is, is that you don't have to incorporate it by means of an extension or whatever to your unit. You don't have separate titles. You've got one title, so you own physically the four and a half inch walls of the garage as well when it's included in your unit. But um, you know, as to the statutory requirements for the use of it, I think it remains unchanged. Yeah, it's 100%. And therefore, I think to, to, uh, to finalize this, the conversion of garages into living areas in any complex is highly unlikely to be successful. So if you deal with any such a unit, take extra care, you are going to run into a problem. The chances that it will have to be converted back to garages at some stage is excellent. So don't encourage it. Uh, trustees should be very, very careful not to suggest that they will support it. Um, if there is serious request or it is best to consult with the professionals like Snaimon and the Archer or Multiprof Property Intelligence, let's first establish what the possibilities are that you can ever in future get that approved. If you uh, list a property where it has already been done, uh, I would suggest that you refer that to the agent in your area that you don't like at all because they will run into all types of problems. Try to avoid dealing with it and leave it to the people you don't like. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, I think in 95% of cases it is a bad idea and everybody is going to get into some kind of a problematic situation. Uh, so don't take it uh, that if the trustees say it can be done or they gave permission that you now have a legal uh, unit to deal with. That is enough from for now. We run out of time. Thank you for everybody attending. Uh, we have the email addresses, so we will send you some information on that. Uh, we would really uh, uh, assist you as far as possible, and I'm sure from uh, your own side as well. So please send us questions, uh, make contact, and if you deal in a complex where you uh, sell regularly, speak to the trustees, ask them if they are aware of all of these regulations, and perhaps we can set up a meeting with them and, and see if one can start rectifying this, uh, these situations that will benefit everybody. Thank you, Johan. Thank, uh, thank you for everybody that attended. Thank you for your attendance. Keep well. Bye-bye.